lot to do with the messianic idea, the messianic ideal. What are we dealing with here? With Rabbi Avi Orlo, the vice president of program and innovation at the Foundation for Jewish Camp in New York. Vice president of program and innovation at the Foundation for Jewish Camp in New York. Before joining the Foundation for Jewish Camp in 2008, Rabbi Avi was the campus rabbi and assistant director of the St. Louis Hillel at Washington University and has held numerous positions as rabbi, educator, and youth leader. He spent 17 years as a camper and then educator at Ramah camps in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and US, YUSSR camps in the former Soviet Union. Avi has a BA in religious studies from Columbia University. He was ordained in the charter class at Yeshiva Tchobave Torah. He lives in White Plains with his wife, Cantor Adina Friedman, and their children, Yadid, Yishama, and Muna, and Libby. And he blogs at saidtomyself.com. The Messianic Idea, the Messianic Ideal. Rabbi Avi Orlo, thanks for being here. Uh, thanks for having me. Hi, everybody. Um, oh, I'm getting some messages. So, hi, everybody. Um, uh, it's great to be with you. And uh, thank you, Shmuley, for this opportunity. Um, I guess the introduction sort of like is like, why would I pick this topic? And um, camps are sort of like in an interesting place right now. They're trying to finish out their summers, depending on what part of the country they're in. Uh, but I think that there's something really compelling a, a, a about camp is that they're really sort of this utopian vision of reality that they can actually bring into existence because they're creating these bubbles. Obviously now they need to create these bubbles more than ever because of COVID. Uh, but there's something really interesting ideologically that they're able to sort of profess an imagination about the way that they want the world to be. Uh, so uh, as much as we don't, we, meaning we at the Federal Jewish Camp or we as mainstream Jewish civilization don't really talk about messianism so much, gets a little messy. Um, I think it is interesting how the field of Jewish camping actually does in some interesting ways, but we don't do it in overt terms. We talk about these ideal utopian vision about how we can make it be in that way. Um, so I just think it's interesting to sort of put that out there as sort of uh, this question of like, what is with this idea of messianism? Why is it so messy? Who does talk about it? Who doesn't talk about it? Is this something that we're like, oh, we always talk about this or we don't. So I just actually wanted to open up as an opportunity for people to share who they are, where they're coming from. Also like, where does this idea show up in your life or not? And sort of like, who does own this conversation around messianism and why or why not? Um, and so, no, you're not, there's no compulsion to speak, but just wanted to open the floor because messianism is a messy topic. So just chime in, put it in chat, or just take yourself off of mute and share it in. And uh, we'll see where this conversation goes. I've got a lot of sources here to play with. Uh, if we don't get to them, that's also okay. But I just want to sort of start with where we are at. Our uh, modern Orthodox shul um, over a year ago hired a Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi, I shouldn't say the Rebbe, Lubavitcher Rabbi. So every shiur he gives uh, always ends with uh, a, a comment about Yavon HaMashiach. So that's where Messianism comes in for me. I, I've never really thought about it that much, but I know Chabad is very fixated on it. So that, thank you. I mean, I think it's just something interesting within the Jewish belt way that we're, we're, we're okay understanding that Chabad sort of owns the discourse around this. Um, for better or for worse, whether you agree with them or they're not, they're, they're running the show. You know, they're, they're the ones out in front on this. So thank you, Lauren, for sharing that. Anyone else? So, wanna... Yeah, so I've, I feel the only way Jewish communal work makes sense is if we have a vision of a better world and if we are engaged in some process to try to build that better world. And so the messianic ideal sort of means like there is a path, there is a process that we can participate in, in trying to get to a more ideal state of being. Right, so it, it, I love what you're saying. I definitely relate to that. And that's why I was framing this in terms of camps. I'm sure there are plenty of camps that I deal with that sort of, I'm not sure they use the word messianism at all, uh, but a lot of camps are dealing with our socialist camps and that sort of pr uh, broadcasting that this is an economic vision they have for the world of how to organize, and that is profound. They may or may not associate that with a messianic uh, official title, but that's a brilliant understanding about like they see the way they want the world to be, 
and they're doing their thing to get it there. Uh, any other people want to chime in? People are smiling. That's okay. Uh, with, but feel free to pop in. Um, one reason I also wanted to bring up the conversation, feel free to jump in sort of where we are in the conversation. Uh, I mean, Laurie made the point about Chabad. I think that a lot of the public discourse in the United States uh, is not really about Chabad. It's about sort of Christianity as sort of the dominant culture religion. And that they sort of have a very clear vision of what the Messiah thing is about. And, and we're sort of as Jews who feel more or less comfortable saying that's not our that's not us um, are happy or less happy with that idea and therefore choose to just not engage in it as opposed to saying we disagree with you um, and similarly with Chabad it's sort of like are we going to disengage around it or are we going to engage and say there's a place of agreement or disagreement um, and and that's from a theological perspective or from Shmuley's perspective of like a how do we want to associate ourselves in terms of a communal order? How do we sort of want to work together in common cause? Um, it's just interesting to see like how uh, in American general where that discourse is and sort of in the Jewish community where the discourse is. Um, and I just wanted to sort of kick the horn hornet's nest and actually jump into it a little bit in terms of uh, this topic. Uh, I specifically, I, I wanted to sort of come in through the back door and if, um, if, uh, Eddie, can you put up the um, source sheet again, just to make sure everyone has it? Thank you. You can go click through there. There's a Google Doc with the sources that we're going to be looking at today. And I just really wanted to open up with sort of like, in some sense, if you look across history, like the, mo the messianic moments are highlighted by uh, something that's actually very hauntingly a moment I think many of us find ourselves in right now. Um, so. I'm just gonna open up and look at first source number on here. Uh, we, do, we sing this over in um, the Greats After Meals, is uh, they, they who sow in tears shall reap uh, with songs of joy. Though he goes alone and weeping, carrying the seed bag, he shall come back with songs of joy, carrying his sheaves. The Kol Hator, which is a student of the Vilna Gaon, he writes a whole treatise on Messianism. Um, he actually says that this, the footsteps of the Messiah will be like this. Every good thing will come out of pain and distress. We can stop there, we can go, I mean, but just to name the fact that it's often out of moments of high disorder, chaos and distress, that we see a spike in human history of this idea of a messianic era of like, it's gotta get darkest, you know, you know it's gonna get the, the darkest moment's gonna come right before the light. And there's sort of this moment of sort of absolute distress and chaos um, is these moments that actually give themselves to, to society to say, there's gotta be something better here. Um, and um, I, I'm not sure we're there right now. I thought we were leaving this place and you know, with the launch of Elul that maybe we're in a better place, but then Delta came and I don't know if we're going into COVID or out of COVID. Uh, I don't know where things are politically in the world, but like I just recognizing that they're the moments that we're most in touch with the, the, the tears that often are the moments that we're sort of searching as a society for the depths for that sort of uplift of the messianic vision. Uh, here he goes on to the sort of imagination of uh, sort of the uh, understanding from the language here that there might be two kinds of messiahs, the Messiah Ben Yosef, uh, Messiah, the Messiah son of David. Uh, we know much more about the Messiah Ben, uh, ben David than the Messiah Ben Yosef. Uh, there's many different understandings of where that goes. We're not actually getting into all that right now, but it is, there is a whole world of thinking about sort of the different kinds of messiahs for different kinds of fixes to the world. But it's the moment that we see that's most broken that we think is gonna be the sort of precursor for what could be fixed. Um, and that could be a theological space or uh, as Shmuel was saying sort of a, how are we gonna sort of, what is our common cause? What are we gonna work for? Um, so I'm gonna pause again. When I say the word Messiah, right? Uh, I often go to Life of Brian, but you know, you can go somewhere else to actually think about sort of like, what are you thinking about? What are our assumptions when we say, oh, we're, we hope for the, you know, hope the Mashiach should come now or Messiah, Messianic era is upon us or, oh, we should hope for this. What does that mean to you? Does it mean nothing? Are we just totally checked out of that conversation? Which is also probable and true. Like, where does this register in our mind? What are, we, what are our assumptions around when someone says the word Messiah, I agree or disagree, but this is what the common language means. 
Any thoughts there? Well, we can ask. We, we can ask whether the whether the Messiah, whether King David or somebody is the Messiah, and what causes the Messiah to come? Does God cause the Messiah to come, or do we cause the Messiah to come? That's an interesting point. You know, from Shmuley's from Shmuley's point of view and mine, um, uh, the work we do causes a better world, which then invites in the Messiah. Great, thank you, David. Any other assumptions people have with this word uh, of Messiah? I, I, hi, my name is Kara. I can't, uh, for some reason, I can't uh, show my face. I don't know why it, it won't let me un it won't let me start video. But when I first heard about this was going to be about the Messiah, I have to say it, the first thing I thought of was um, was uh, Jews for Jesus and Messianic Judaism, and then. Afterwards, I thought of so so I'm maybe I'm checked out with the concept of the Messiah, but then I, I also thought of the the scene from Fiddler on the Roof when they're all going out and he says, "Well, ha we prayed for the Messiah. All these wouldn't this be a good time for him to come?" And then he said, "We'll have to start praying. So we'll have to find him somewhere else or whatever the words were." But that's what those are my two things that came to mind with Messiah. But the first was sort of almost a Frightening one. So, so but I want to respond to both things Kara said. One is, a, I agree with you. Like most times, like even when people use God talk, let alone messianic talk, I want to check out because, like, I don't share common meaning with you, let alone agreement with you. You know, so like I think there's a part of me, and maybe that's part of my own sort of German Jewish upbringing that like took spirituality and killed it. Who knows? But like, I, I think that there's an element here that I I feel discomfort because it's not my language. Uh, Sidebar, just Carrie, you should know this if you don't, is um, the original score for Fiddler on the Roof had a totally different ending, which was When Messiah Comes. And if you haven't looked it up, you should totally look it up. It's a totally I, different I, I, ending to the, to the whole play, which actually said, it was actually incredibly farcical. But when people saw the original off-Broadway production, they said they needed a cry at the end, not the sort of farcical sort of making fun of that the Messiah is never gonna come. Right. Wow. So it's just interesting. You know the of, song. I do know the song. I'm saying so. It's just for anyone yeah. out there. It's sort of like it, there is a lot of this, which is fascinating because it's knit into the sort of basis of Judaism, and still we don't want to talk about it or we want to make fun of it. You know. So there's a joke that goes. You know, they hired a, in a town. They hired someone to sit out out to the edge of the town, waiting for the Messiah to come. And he says, "How much do you money do you make?" So it's not that much, but uh, it's a job for life. You know, so like, like there's an assumption that this is an idea that will by design never be fulfilled. You know, so it is sort of interesting unto itself. Any other assumptions that people want to throw out there before I get lost in Broadway? I was thinking with your question about the zeitgeist around this belief. And I was like, well, we're not in a Frankist moment or a Sabatian moment, moment or hyper Kabbalistic moment. Like we don't have many false messiahs emerging. But then I was thinking about it. We have a breakdown in society today of trust and authority. Like we are very skeptical of people who are considered to be great, who hold the truth, who are going to um, be morally virtuous. There's an attempt to break them down. And I think perhaps we're in the most anti-Messianic era in, in human history, in a sense. So the whole notion of there's going to be a redeemer in human flesh is like the antithesis of all rationality. Um, and so I guess from a traditional heretical perspective, divorcing messianism from a messiah uh, is kind of what happens in secularism. And I think that's kind of where, you know, liberal Jews are, are at right now, a disbelief in anything in the flesh. Yeah, I mean, I think there's something interesting. If I always wanted to uh, rewrite, uh, you know, that short story, if not higher, that, that they believe that the Rebbe is a wonder worker and he goes to heaven, you know, and the guy hides under his bed and follows him. And, and he finds out that he's actually, the Rebbe puts on, you know, uh, the, the wood chopper's clothes and goes out and chops wood and hands it to the old lady. You know, and when he comes back to report, you know, you know, where's the Rebbe go before Shabbat? You know, the Chazim say, he goes to heaven and the lit box says begrudgingly, if not higher. And I'm thinking like, you couldn't even write this story right now because he would have already taken a selfie with himself and the Rebbe. You know, like, so, like we have such a high bar of, what is authenticity in the media of 21st century Western civilization 
that everything is being recorded, there's no mysticism. There's no, you sort of like there's such a thirst for authenticity and representation. It's impossible um, that we're starving for authenticity. Um, I, I'm not disagreeing with you, Shmuley. I'm just naming the fact that like we're living in an interesting time where even if one could suspend your imagination and say, could the Messiah come? Like we'd be like, like in what media would they use to communicate their arrival? And, and ha would they have enough followers? Would, you know, would it get enough likes, you know, whatever that is? Um, or by design, is it sort of so, it couldn't happen, right? Uh, but I do like your distinction as well between messianism and the Messiah itself. Any other assumptions people want to share with the group? Someone who read source number three for us, which is the uh, Rambam sort of, as we know, Rambam says in the thir 13 uh, articles of faith, uh, you know, I believe in wholeheartedly, you know, the Messiah will come. So he clearly made the uh, the top billing here, you know, uh, but, you know, he, he has a whole bunch of laws here. I'm just, I pulled out a few of them here. If someone could read, uh, start reading. We're not going to read the whole source number three. Someone start reading it for us. Be awesome. The King Messiah will arise and reestablish the monarchy of David as it was in former times. He will build the sanctuary and gather in the dispersed of Israel. All the earlier statutes will be restored as they once were. Sacrifices will be offered. The sabbatical and jubilee years will be observed as commanded in the Torah. Anyone who does not believe in him or one who does not anticipate his coming not only denies the prophets, but also the Torah and Moses, our teacher. For the Torah stop, has- Stop, 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 stop. Pause me, Fred. So just, to, just sort of interesting is sort of, Julia sort of surfaced some of Rambo's assumptions around sort of like, this is how we'll know. You know, these are the things. Um, and this also gets to us to a rather uncomfortable place of, uh, you know, a lot of evangelical Christians who are happy to pay for Zionism, you know, pay for Jews to move back to Israel because this will hasten the return of the Messiah because here it says it right here. You know, like it's like this is this will be proof. Uh, but also like the language here of anyone who does not believe in him, question mark on the gender, we're just gonna leave it out there, or one who does not anticipate his coming. So what's the difference between sort of believing versus anticipating? Right? Like there's sort of like and I think this gets to maybe some of what Shmuley was saying is sort of the um, I believe that. I believe in the Messiah versus like, I believe that I should anticipate the, the coming of the Messiah and, and how those are two different activities actually uh, of actually belief in X or anticipation of X. I don't know what to make of it. I just wanted to surface that as sort of like an interesting flourish of language. Any thoughts on that? Lauren took herself off of mute, put herself back on mute. Yeah, oh, could, could it be that, um... Anticipation would be working towards some of the Chabad does it, but you know, I, I even think of back in 1968 and, and again in 73 in Israel, um, definitely the, the belief, you know, there was a feeling that uh, this was, it was holy, what was happening, it was a miracle and uh, Mashiach is on the way or the Messianic age is on the way. And that's when many people um, moved to Yehud and Shamran. Also anticipation in, in getting the land ready for Mashiach to come. Awesome. Uh, any other thoughts? Shmuley, did you want to elaborate what you wrote here? Nope, we're good. Okay, great. Uh, any other thoughts? Uh, so I, actually, I'm not going to go into this because I think there's like, we could go down like, 1900 different rabbit holes of sort of like what are the signs what are the you know like and then it gives me back to life of brian again uh like what are the signs of the true messiah like all those things um i actually want to I'm more interested sort of like pull back from this discussion and actually say that's interesting who owns the discourse where is the discourse uh, on the, the something that's sort of seemingly so fundamental or shared across jewish ideology but in a way that we're all winking and nudging and saying, but not for real, you know, in a way that's sort of like, what's the bigger context uh, about how this messianic ideal might fit, fit within a larger understanding of Judaism? So I, I'm, I'm doing a bit of a sidestep here on purpose because I don't want to get down all the different rabbit holes. And there's so many rabbit holes here. 
uh, but to actually go in a different direction of saying, what is the larger context? Meaning, how does this idea of the Messiah or messianism fit into a larger Jewish project? So with this, I wanna actually take us to sort of the simplest level. If someone could else could read source number four for us, this is sort of like the most boilerplate, sim simple understanding of what is this thing called Judaism? Um, this is uh, from the Midrash of, of um, someone can read source number four first. Go for it, Lauren. Yeah, I can read it. Um, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Rabbi Akiva said that this is the general principle of Torah. Ben Azai says that the book of generations of Adam is really the general principle. So this, this is a question which is sort of like, what is the fundamental truth of this Judaism project? And there's, at the core level, there's a, a disagreement. Rabbi Akiva on one side and Ben Azai on the other. Rebbe Kiva is quoting here and says, you should love your neighbors yourself, um, which is his own fascinating rationale. It's sort of like, that is everything. Everything else is sort of a subordinate category of this, where Ben Azai says, Jesus generations, is, this is a concept of everyone's created in the image of God, right? Everyone is, is, is a, uh, everyone is a descendant of Adam and, and Eve, and therefore everyone is created in the image of God. And that is the fundamental notion of Judaism. So that itself is a fascinating discussion of like, if this is the boilerplate about, if this is the rule of Judaism, uh, what are these two schools discussing here? Why are they discussing this? What is the Judaism that they're discussing? Any thoughts on that? Uh, I'm not sure what the big difference between the two is. I mean, if you're, if you're, say, if you're, saying, uh, if you're saying everyone is created in the image of God, and then you're saying, love the other person as yourself. Basically, the, the answer is recognize, recognize the oneness that is all of us and act accordingly. It's the same message. I'm not sure where, where they're so different. Uh, does anyone have a potential? Um, any other, any, any, anyone take uh, David up on this one? I think I think there are people. There is ways to express your faith that David is one hundred percent correct, and there might be ways to disagree with David. So, I'll offer. I mean, just an interesting read, which is uh, right now as a modern, Rebbe Kiva makes a lot more sense to me. Which is, I'm not sure I believe in God. I'm not sure he needs me to believe in God. All he needs me to believe in is. That have to love my neighbor um, as myself, and it's not. Pre, it's not. Pre, there's no prerequisite of a theological statement. It's saying I believe in David, and therefore I need to treat David as myself. Like I, that's that is a. Um, I don't need God for that statement, right? Uh, interesting enough, Ben Ben Asa could say, "Yeah, I believe in God, but I'm not sure I believe in humanity." You know, but but I I feel a sense of pride. They might be convergent in as much as David's correct, which is be a mensch, like you should still be a good person, right? And they have the same result. Uh, but interestingly, they both have sort of ideological shortfallings, which is, um, it, you know, it, it both actually seemingly are connected to their own um, biography, meaning- so well, they're, connect, they're, they're connected in that we're, we're all made in the image of God, the Tzolom Elohim. If you believe in God. But if you don't believe in God, you're, you're allowed to be a schmuck. Like that's, that's, that's the, I mean, that's a problem we have, which is, is Judaism only for the believers? I'm not saying Judaism is not a faith, but it's not only a faith. You know, okay. so Rabbi Kiva can come by and say, look, I don't care if you believe in God. This thing is telling you, you have to be a good person. This is how you be a good person. Everything else is a derivative of that. I'm not saying Rabbi Kiva didn't believe in God. I'm just saying that this is the general rule that he's putting forward, which is you don't necessarily need to believe in God. Uh, interestingly enough, Rabbi Kiva himself was someone who was, illiterate, distance from Judaism, and came to a love of Torah through his love of his wife. And he went and he said, Rachel, I want to marry. She says, go to yeshiva, then we'll talk about it. So like he only, his love, his literal love of his wife is what brought him to the enterprise of Torah. So this is very much a biographical statement. And similarly, you could say the thing of Ben Azai, which is uh, they never gave him the title rabbi because he never got married. 
he, he they wouldn't give him that title. He was very learned. Uh, he had a love affair with God, but he never manifested that love to his neighbor. So he didn't really understand humanity in that sense in ways that he could understand theologically. You know, so it is interesting sort of, we might both come to David's truth that there might be a uh, confluence here, but we might have very different life experiences that might lead us to that path. Um, but regardless, I think that this principle actually is expressed more thoroughly by Rav Akiva and the next source. Uh, and I think that gets us to a very different place that will hopefully be uh, open up the conversation more, which is um, what, what, what is stipulated behind this? So can someone start reading us source number five here? I can go ahead and read it. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, he, Rabbi Akiva, used to say, beloved is humankind that he was created in, his, in the image of God. An extra love is that it was made known to him and that he was created in God's image, as, if, as it says. For in God's own image, God made humankind. Beloved are the Jews that have that they are called children to the omnipresent. An extra love is that it was made known to them that they are called children to God, as it says, you are children of the Lord, your God. Beloved are the Jews that there have been given to them the precious instrument. An extra love is that it was made known to them and that they were given the precious instrument of the world's creation, as it says, for I give you good presents. Do not force my teaching. There's a lot to unpack here. Eddie doesn't have to unpack it for us, but uh, thank you for reading. Um, there's a lot going on here. And seemingly this is all sort of derivative of the same expression, but uh, maybe not. Maybe this proves David's point, which is he's saying, we, we see in one place, he says, the cloud God's on Torah is you should love your neighbor. But the premise here is, the most, you know, beloved is humankind that they're created in the image of God. So it's not that he's disagreeing with Ben Azai. It's just notable that's sort of a different trajectory. Uh, but what's what what else is help us unpack source number five here is from Pirkei Avos. What does it mean that there's there's clearly a pattern here? It's X. Oh, that was great, but like more like a, a, even as important, if not more, is that we know it, right? What what's going on with this? So we have these three things, which is um, we're created in the image of God, right? We're the children of God, and we have these tools that we're given. But in each of the formulations, it's the we have this gift, but the gift is almost like insufficient if it, we didn't we didn't have this other part of it. So the thoughts, respect. You can read it again if it's okay. You can read it again at home if you want. We can take each one individually, even just even take the first one. What does it mean that we're creating an image of God? What does it mean that idea that you're creating an image of God versus there's an extra love that we were informed of it? Even that one alone, meaning like there's a truth, you're creating an image of God. Ben Azai agrees with him, right? Like that's great. But there's an extra love that you were told this. What are the implications of that statement itself? Shmuley, go ahead. I was reading a parenting book recently and it talked about how not to always link your praise for a child with something good they've done because it, it implies that their praiseworthiness is connected to the realm of action as opposed to the realm of being. And so I wonder here also, if you weren't told that you were created by Salam Alakim, you might think, when I do something great, I'm godly. And you might not know that before you've done something great, it's not only in the realm of actualization, in potentiality, in essence, there is something um, divine about you. So this sort of like, this moves us away from conditional love. This is unconditional love. It's not that you're loved, you have to know it's unconditional love. And unconditional value. In white supremacy, you have value based on what you produce. 
right? But if, if, you, if you remove just how productive you are from your value, you have value in, innately. Anyone else want to share thoughts, different directions or the same direction? Um, I have another thought, maybe in a different direction. Um, it seems like if people had been made Batella Malachim, um, then without knowing it, that would be like God giving a gift to God's self um, because now God has all these people that are made just like God. Um, whereas once, if we, but we would be oblivious to the fact, so we wouldn't know that we were made uh, Batella Malachim. But once people know that it's a gift to us because we know that, that like Rabbi Shpuli said, that we are in, in our existence made Batella Malachim uh, in God's image and also that our fellows are also. So it's it's really a gift to humanity and like the, the human world um, that we are aware of it, maybe. Awesome, thank you, Julia. But what do people make up? So the, it's the same, it seems like the same structure in each of these uh, paragraphs here, so you, uh, in stanzas here, you sort of like, so it starts off, beloved or humanity that were created in the image of God, extra love that it's sort of told to us, Beloved are we, maybe this goes to Shmuley's point of this sort of sense of familial relationship to God, extra love that we sort of are told that. And then the third part is we got this, you know, precious instrument, the Torah, you know, and it's like above and beyond. So is this interesting sort of like this formula here? Uh, and it's not just, it doesn't seem like it's enough that we are something or we have something, we need to know it. So I just want to let that sink in for a second because it's I think it's its own fascinating mainframe of Jewish thinking. You know, it's like, what is our gift to humanity? Uh, and David might be right, is maybe it's a haftarach, a kamach, you should love your neighbor yourself, and or we're creating in God's image. Um, but it's insufficient that that's true. It's sort of that we, we need it to be known. So to, to iron this point out and to beat it home a little harder, uh, does anyone know offhand, I could do my bad retelling, but you could do a better retelling of uh, Han Christians Andersen's The Emperor's New Clothes? Laurie, can you can you share with us? The, the, this the longest or shortest version you want to share? Short version, um, the emperor is walking basically naked and everybody's saying, wow, look at those clothes, they're so gorgeous because nobody wants to admit it, right? They, they're, almost, they're deluding themselves in many ways. And a little boy goes, whoa, the, the, the emperor's naked. So that's, that's the story in the nutshell. And we use it often for um, a leader who's all full of pomp and circumstance, but no substance. Right, so there's that, that the emperor side of the story, but what's interesting to me is sort of like, Everyone saw the emperor was naked and it took the mouth of a child to say, there's common mutual knowledge that he's naked. Meaning we all had sort of like, well, maybe he's dressed and I'm the only one who doesn't see it. But it's sort of the purity of the child who can say, the emperor's naked. For us to all be like, oh yeah, the emperor's naked, right? Even the emperor himself didn't know he was naked in that sense. Meaning he, he couldn't confirm it upon himself, his own doubt of the situation. So what's fascinating to me is this source number five here is it's insufficient to say we're creating the image of God. This Habibi uh, Terra, this sort of extra love is that the child said you're creating the image of God. I mean, it's, the extra love is not that the emperor is naked. The extra, the truth is revealed only when the kid says, oh, the emperor is naked. That creates a different actual experience of the world that there's common mutual knowledge about what's going on in that situation. That changes the game. Beforehand, maybe he was naked, maybe he's not naked. Maybe the image of God, maybe I was an image of God. But the Chaviva Yatera, this extra love is that there's common knowledge. We actually share a common understanding that we're all creating the image of God. That actually fundamentally changes the game in like a really fascinating way. Uh, he's just, he, he joined us to exhale. Do you wanna say something? 
the messianic ideal is where we have a shared <laughs> a so, so shared hold project. on that. So, so hold on that. Where that's where we're going, but I just want to take us a couple more clicks along the way here because I think this is where the messianic ideal fits into the Jewish program of what is our common knowledge, right? Um, so I, I'm just going to quickly, sort of for the sake of time, uh, I'll, I'll read source number seven here. Uh, the Rambam again, sort of, e even though the Rambam himself proclaims this is one of the 13 principles of faith, you have to believe in the coming of the Messiah. It says, I don't think that today's the Messiah, anything will be changed in order of the world or that there will be some innovation in the works of creation. Rather, the world will behave according to its custom. And that is written in Isaiah, and the wolf will live with the lamb, and the tiger will lie with the, with the kid, is a metaphor and a riddle. We're going to come back to a metaphor and a riddle. But he's sort of saying, this is, the, this is one of the signs of the coming Messiah is like the lion will you know, live with the land. You know? So the story they told in the, uh, in the Soviet Union was, you know, look, look, we have a red square with the lion and the land. We're living the messianic vision. And the commoner says, how do you do? He says, we change the lamb every day. You know, like, so we could, we could do it as long as we pretend we can do it, right? So he's saying, you're not reading it correctly. It's a metaphor. It's a riddle. We're going to come back to the riddle in a minute. And the idea is Israel will dwell safely with the evil idol worshipers uh, who are compared to a wolf and to a tiger. As it said, the desert wolf will slaughter and the tiger will keep watch over the cities. And everybody will return to the religion of truth and they will not steal and they will not destroy. Rather, they will eat and be permitted things with Israel. And it said, the lion will uh, like the herd and shall eat straw. So he, he's like, say you have to believe in this thing called the Messiah, but what's going to change then, right? What is it like, is it going to be all these signs and wonders or does some bigger project that should, of common cause of world justice of like the, the uprooting of anti-Semitism and like sort of like we could all get along, you know, that's the messianic era, right? So I want to delve a little deeper here and really get, understand sort of like unpack this, what is a riddle, right? What is this common knowledge and riddle? And with this, I ask Eddie to share um, and just take this video and it's a TED video. Um, just watch, um, gonna, uh, sorry, Eddie's gonna share this one of my favorite riddles uh, taken from a TED video and Eddie, number eight. Hold on friends, here we go. All right, can everybody hear it? Oh, yeah. Imagine an island where 100 people, all perfect logicians, are imprisoned by a mad dictator. There's no escape except for one strange rule. Any prisoner can approach the guards at night and ask to leave. If they have green eyes, they'll be released. If not, they'll be tossed into the volcano. As it happens, all 100 prisoners have green eyes, but they've lived there since birth and the dictator has ensured they can't learn their own eye color. There are no reflective surfaces. All water is in opaque containers. And most importantly, they're not allowed to communicate among themselves, though they do see each other during each morning count. Nevertheless, they all know no one would ever risk trying to leave without absolute certainty of success. After much pressure from human rights groups, the dictator reluctantly agrees to let you visit the island and speak to the prisoners under the following conditions. You may only make one statement and you cannot tell them any new information. What can you say to help free the prisoners without incurring the dictator's wrath? After thinking long and hard, you tell the crowd, at least one of you has green eyes. The dictator is suspicious, but reassures himself that your statement couldn't have changed anything. You leave, and life on the island seems to go on as before. But on the hundredth morning after your visit, all the prisoners are gone, each having asked to leave the previous night. So how did you outsmart the dictator? It might help to realize that the amount of prisoners is arbitrary. Let's simplify things by imagining just two, Adria and Bill. Each sees one person with green eyes, and for all they know, 
That could be the only one. For the first night, each stays put. But when they see each other still there in the morning, they gain new information. Adria realizes that if Bill had seen a non-green-eyed person next to him, he would have left the first night. After concluding, the statement could only refer to himself. Bill simultaneously realizes the same thing about Adria. The fact that the other person waited tells each prisoner his or her own eyes must be green. And on the second morning, they're both gone. Now imagine a third prisoner. Adria, Bill, and Carl each see two green-eyed people, but aren't sure if each of the others is also seeing two green-eyed people, or just one. They wait out the first night as before, but the next morning, they still can't be sure. Carl thinks, if I have non-green eyes, Adria and Bill were just watching each other and will now both leave on the second night. But when he sees both of them the third morning, he realizes they must have been watching him too. Adria and Bill have each been going through the same process and they all leave on the third night. Using this sort of inductive reasoning, we can see that the pattern will repeat no matter how many prisoners you add. The key is the concept of common knowledge, coined by philosopher David Lewis. The new information was not contained in your statement itself, but in telling it to everyone simultaneously. Now, besides knowing at least one of them has green eyes, each prisoner also knows that everyone else is keeping track of all the green-eyed people they can see, and that each of them also knows this, and so on. What any given prisoner doesn't know is whether they themselves are one of the green-eyed people the others are keeping track of, until as many nights have passed as the number of prisoners on the island. Of course, you could have spared the prisoners 98 days on the island by telling them, at least 99 of you have green eyes. But when mad dictators are involved, you're best off with a good head start. Okay, thank you, Eddie. Um, okay. Um, okay, how does, this, uh, how does this all fit together is the question. Um, I'll tell a story to uh, say this more, but I think that the messianic question is amazing because the messianic question asks a, creates a common knowledge. But the problem is most people who are dealing with the messianic question lead with the messianic answer. There's something fundamental of Judaism that says there's a common knowledge whether you believe in David's convergence of the believing everyone's created image of God equals the same as loving your neighbors yourself, but there's something sort of like we all know this that creates a different reality that we're operating within. And the messianic question is it saying, is there a common mutual shared knowledge and doubt, which is who is the Messiah? And how do I not only look at every human being and say, oh, they are minimally creating the image of God, maximally they can get us off the island. You know, maximally I look at every person and say, wow, they might have the green eyes, but maybe it's me. So it's important to understand sort of like the question of the Messiah is tantamount to the woman coming and saying, at least one person has green eyes on the island, which fundamentally changes our common knowledge about what it means to be a human being. Not that we're creating the image of God, but that we could actually have the key to make the world a better place. So I'm gonna leave that out there for let people think about for a second. Responses, thoughts, rebuttals. I'll, I'll even say something spicier, which is to say, does the answer for saying, I know who the Messiah is, ruin the common knowledge? Meaning, does the answer saying this is the Messiah actually ruin the very premise of that there is a Messiah? Because then it transforms that I know it's not you, it's not you, it's not you. So to that, I'm going to share a story. Um, hopefully this will open up the room for a little bit differently. The story goes, uh, I couldn't find the original story. This was told me it was little, so I'll, I'll reconstruct it. Um, but the story goes, there was a shtetl 
and there is a Rav in the shtetl, and uh, he thirsted for a sort of intellectual companionship, and there really wasn't anyone in the town. So over time, he actually became friends with the abbot of the nearby monastery, and they would meet regularly in like a little dacha in the woods, and they would discuss philosophy, they would discuss theology, but they were never, the rule was they could never talk about each other's community because it was too political, it was too challenging. Um, and they would meet and they would meet and they loved each other and they met. met. And um, at one time they met and the priest says, look, I, I have to break the rule. And the rabbi says, what do you, what do you mean? He says, I overheard that there's a, a pogrom that's coming and it's gonna kill all the people in your town. You have to leave. I know I'm breaking the rule, but I had to break the rule because your whole community is at risk. And the rabbi says, thank you so much, holy brother, for saving me and my, 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 my people. Um, I have to be honest, um, I've been holding a secret for a long time and because of our rule, I didn't share it with you. But now that you broke the rule, I have to share this piece of news with you before I go. I have to tell you, um, I know that one of the people in your monastery is the Messiah. And now I have to go and he takes his community and leaves. Meanwhile, the abbot goes back to the community and he doesn't know what to do. But every single person he sees is like, who, who could it be? Like, is, is it Brother Michael? He's such a fat slob, but he's such a wonderful artist. Maybe, maybe it is Brother Michael, you know, is, you know, is it goes through the all and, and everybody interacts with this sort of chance forms his interactions with him. Because he originally was looking for other ways that he could improve his, his uh, people in his care. But then he started thinking each one, maybe they're the Messiah. And eventually, you know, the other abbots, uh, other people in the monastery are like, what's going on here? And he says, I have to tell you the secret that um, I've been meeting with this rabbi for many years. And he told us, he told me that one of the people in our monastery is the Messiah. And this transformed their community. And then people were attracted to, the, to this church because the glow of what they saw in each other radiated out. And at the end of uh, his days, the abbot brought his uh, the original members of the monastery together. And they said, okay, now you can tell us you're about to die. Who's the Messiah? And he says, it is clear the Messiah is one of us. I think there's something fundamental about the messianic ideal that it's not about the Messiah. It's about how it transforms the way you see every single human being. The foundation of ethical Judaism is founded on this notion that we believe everyone's created in the image of God and therefore has inalienable rights that can never be taken away from them, full stop. But that is insufficient. Chaviv Yatera, there's an additional love that is known to us that the Messiah is among us and that we should look at every single human being as if they have that potential. They have the potential of getting us off the island. And it's not just the baseline of what I owe you, it is what do I see in you that's gonna redeem all of us? And how does that transform me not looking at your faults, but looking at your gifts that you bring to the, to the monastery? Um, and how does that transform our world? Um, I, I think that there's something fundamental that changes around how you see yourself and how you see the world and how, how you can operate in the world. If the messianic question is always at your top of your minds and how are you engaging the world? Um, so I put that out there. Um, thoughts and responses to that. And then I'll ask Eddie to share the last little video. I saw some furrowed brows, which is always a good thing. Well, the way I thought the story was gonna end was that uh, uh, one of the people in the, uh, in, the, in the monastery or all the people in the monastery then, they were gonna be also told the other secret uh you know that the uh you know the, the, the uh, what was going to happen to the to the jews and they were going to look at each other and they were going to say well who's going to do something about it uh maybe i'm the one to do something about it and then and so they all decide they're going to do something about it and they and they save you know they save the other community that's the jewish thing is you act upon it <laughs> you, you don't just you don't just sit and think okay you know may, maybe there's something wonderful about me Thank you, David. Anyone else? Reflections?
Well, I, I think um, the way you described it, uh, what you told the story, um, I, I, I sort of felt a lightness after you told that story, that there was, um, that we approach others with the potentiality of the light that's within them. And it was a reminder to me, it was a reminder to me um, about, um, very hopeful reminder to me of how we, how we approach, approach other people in our lives or other people out there as having, having the, the divine within them and recognizing that, remembering that. So that, that was, that was my take on, on uh, your piece. It's not just about our responsibilities to them. It's about the uh, infinite potential yes. of every single person. Uh, and, and I think what I shared the riddle is because we don't always even know this about ourselves. You know, we often need someone else to sort of affirm this about ourselves. So when I'm seeing the potential in you, you're often reflecting back the potential in me. Uh, it's just always fascinating that I, um, I, someone's like, how much do we actually understand our role in society could be and our unlimited, our own unlimited potential and how we have to sort of unlock it in others to unlock it in ourselves. Um, any other um, thoughts people want to add? So, so I love it. I just want to share one thing I'm struggling with. Um, you know, I mean, one of the post-Holocaust uh, moral dilemmas we grapple with is how do we prevent dehumanization? And so in the Levinas project, we say, no, 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 no big ideals. It's just the flesh. It's just the face, right? They don't have to be godly. They don't have to be reasonable or rational or strong, right? And I wonder, like, it's so easy to dehumanize. Oh, that person I can see is not virtuous. They're less than human. And what does it mean if we de demessianize? Right? If we raise the bar for what it means to kind of see someone as great, and it becomes that much easier to demessianize, oh, these 50 in the camp are clearly not the Messiah, so we can treat them as such. Right? So I guess part of my concern with raising the bar for the greatness of the person is what happens when it's removed, when, it, when, it's, when it's removed from certain populations. I mean, I think this is why I offered that sort of, I wanted to fit the messianic ideal within the Jewish framework, which is everyone has a baseline of rights and responsibility, you know, rights and therefore human has, we have responsibilities to them because the creative image and the image of God, that that creates common knowledge, you know, that creates responsibility. But that is like the social net for humanity. Uh, we also need an aspiration, you know, so like, uh, so I, I think Rebbe Kiva has an answer for the camps. The question is what's going to get us out of the camps, you know, like, and what's going to get us is sort of to, to the next level. Um, and I think that sort of, um, it's so obvious and hardwired to Jewish life, this idea of either a hafta recha, you shall love your neighbor, and or with the image of God as the baseline for morality and ethics. And I think similarly, I want to reclaim a messianic ideal as a vision of aspiration that every single person could actually cure cancer and poverty, uh, whatever the things are that would get us off the island to sort of make the world a better place, it is insufficient just to have a net. We need, we need to actually bust the glass ceiling of actually imagining how the world could be. And we need to sort of put those glasses on to make sure that we're looking at everyone saying, could you be the one? Could you be the one? Could you be the one? And in asking a question enough, you might come to the realization that Maybe you are that one. Maybe, 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 and maybe it's even you. But I'm, I'm starting the position by saying it could be you, it could be you, it could be you. And, and, and maybe in asking that, maybe I've become it. You know, maybe I've, maybe I've become the, to live up to that aspiration. Um, Eddie, can you show the last little bit? It's really, really short and I'll translate it. But I think it's sort of a fascinating. This is Yeshai Leibu, it's a Jewish philosopher. It's a very, very short video. Um, and he was sort of asked, does he believe in the coming of the Messiah?
כל משיח שבא, כל משיח שקר, מפני שמהותו של המשיח הוא שהוא יבוא. So it's a fascinating threading of the needle of saying, I'm a believer because I believe the Messiah is going to come. That anyone who's claimed that they came is already, that's the answer, not the question. I believe Bemuna Shlema with a pure heart in the messianic question. And in the belief that we should anticipate it. We should be looking at every single human being as if they're the ones who could help us bring about a new reality. But the minute that they came, it's already not real. It's not what we need, right? So like I'm just saying, I think the Jewish stance on this is to be totally not happy with anyone who answers the question, but totally happy with sort of driving to the question. Uh, Rav Chaim Siddler Feller said very brilliantly, he says, we live in a world with two street corners. On one side, there's someone screaming, saying, come with me, I have all the answers. And the other side saying, come with me, I have all the questions. And, and I, I it's, it's pretty clear we need to stand. Uh, if we want to see progress in the world, we need to stand with the place of questions and same with Yishai Luiz is saying that the Messiah will come and, and that I will have that anticipation and that vantage point to every single human being to not only meet their basic needs and necessities of their divine image, but also see their infinite potential. And the messianic question enables us to look at people to unlock that potential. And uh, then, like uh, uh, someone said before, uh, maybe it comes speedily in our day uh, that we so at least understand the question and share the question and lift up the question. And with that, uh, open to anything else, but wanted to say thank you to Shmuley for uh, giving me a chance to share an idea that I don't often get to share at work, so. Amazing, amazing. Um, thank you so much. This has been amazing, as always, creative and imaginative. And we look forward to continuing to learn with you. And uh, friends, we hope you will join us tomorrow as well. One o'clock Pacific with Rabbi Sharon Browse for our Hammerman Family Lecture. One o'clock Pacific, four o'clock Eastern tomorrow. We hope you'll join us, Rabbi Avi Orlo. Thank you so much. Uh, friends, we didn't get through all the sources, so we hope you'll spend more time looking through some of these sources here. Have a great rest of your day. Chodesh Tov. Wishing everyone a meaningful, uplifting Elul.